Good morning. Welcome to this webinar about air permeability in isolation rooms. My name is Blanca Beato and I'm the microclimate team leader of Fisher Test. This is the second webinar that Vistria has carried out about isolation rooms. The first one was yesterday and it talked about isolation rooms in general and the work that Vistria has carried out. And this webinar today is going to be dealing with air tightness and how to calculate air permeability in isolation rooms. We're going to begin with a brief introduction uh, on isolation rooms, the types of isolation rooms that there are, which some of you may have seen in yesterday's presentation, but which, which is a way to introduce the isolation rooms before we focus on air tightness. Then we will go through the challenges that we face and how to calculate the air tightness and what is BTS3 2018. We will continue with an example and then finally we're going to sum up this presentation. We're going to begin with a brief introduction to the category levels of pathogens and how as engineers we use air to contain urban infection. Pathogens are classified in four biosafety levels or category levels from one, which are pathogens which do not normally cause human disease, such as Bacillus subtilis, for example. Um, two are those that can cause human disease, but whose potential for transmission is limited. Biosafety level three are those that can be transmitted via the air, and biosafety level four are exotic agents, for example, Ebola. Isolation rooms or laboratories, as you can see on the right hand side of the picture, um, isolation rooms or laboratories that deal with pathogens have to be of the same biosafety level and are designed differently if they're for a category two or for a category four. As engineers, we mentioned yesterday that we use the air to contain urban infections in two ways. Once staff and visitors are inside the room, we use the air movement in the room to protect them and to also to protect the patient. Uh, for example, we have different methodologies such as piston flow when we want staff to be exposed to fresh air all the time. And, um, and for example, in some category four applications or operating in theaters, but sometimes in isolation rooms, we can also use a well mixed design, which consists in mixing the air and diluting the concentration of contaminants. So it means that staff are not exposed to 100% fresh air, but the pathogens are diluted in a way that is not that is enough not to infect them. And when it comes to the relationship between the air in the isolation room and the rest of the hospital, well, air travels from higher pressure areas to lower pressure areas and we try and find any small hole to escape even the fabric of the walls. And this is why air tightness is so important. What you can see here is how we use pressure differentials in a positively pressurized isolation room to protect an immunocompromised patient. So we make sure that the air travels from the room into the rest of the hospital and not the other way around. On the other hand, when we have a patient that is infectious, we could put the patient into a negative isolation room to ensure that the air travels from the rest of the hospital into the isolation room. And in this case, we, we would be successful in containing the infection. But we also have to think of the protection of the patient because the patient could be exposed to some infectious air uh, that is occurring outside of the hospital that may come into the isolation room. So in this case, a solution uh, would be what we see in this next slide, which is to build an airlock, to build a pressurized area that is at a higher pressure than both the hospital and the patient's isolation room. And therefore, air cannot travel from the rest of the hospital into the isolation room or the other way around. So these rooms can actually be used for patients who are immunocompromised and for patients that are infectious. One of the designs that Bisra has tested and validated, which is also the design that we are going to um, to see about uh, Ertanus tests today, is um, is this one. Um, it consists of uh, an entrance, positively pressurized ventilated lobby, the, the patient's room or isolation room, and the end suite bathroom. And we would supply air mechanically into the lobby. Uh, the lobby gets pressurized, some of the air will go through gaps in the door into the rest of the hospital 
and through the door into the patient's, uh, patient's room. Uh, most of the air will go through the pressure stabilizer, um, through the pressure stabilizer, which is above the door, uh, which is uh, so approximately 100 liters a second will go into the isolation room. The air mixes in the room, it dilutes the concentration of contaminant, and then it's extracted through, through the uh, ensuite bathroom, which is a slightly negative pressure, and then it's uh, filtered and it's extracted outside. When we build isolation rooms, we can face some challenges, and these can be, for example, that the rooms do not achieve the design pressure despite having the correct supply and extra flow rates. Um, it could be that the pressure stabilizer does not open, or uh, that we have to increase the air handling units, and they have to they have to work really hard or harder than they were designed, because the room is just not getting enough pressurization. Um, so there is a huge gap between the design of, uh, there can be a huge gap between the design of an isolation room and, and the real isolation room. And never better said, because most of these problems can be sorted out with air tightness by, fi by finding and sealing the gaps. So air tightness is a way to measure what the air leakage in a room is. And for this purpose, Visha has published a technical standard, BTS3 2018, which is free to download from the BISRA webpage and which explains how to do an air tennis test in an isolation suite. Um, this test is, is based on the ATMA technical standard, so an engineer who knows how to do an air tennis test can carry out these tests very easily. Um, it's just instead of carrying these tests in the building or in, in, in a house, uh, what we do is we carry them in an isolation suite. And we propose a series of tests depending on the room design, and uh, they should only take one day to do. Right, in, in the standard, we give uh, two examples of, um, of two common isolation room de rooms designs. One is the one that we're going to see today with a lobby, patient's room, and ensuite bathroom. And the other one is just a patient's room with ensuite bathroom and no entrance lobby, which is another common design for um, isolation rooms. So I mentioned that it only takes one day to test, but what it is very important, what is very important is that the rooms are properly built and sealed so that they can achieve the air permeability required when we first test. What happens sometimes is that the rooms uh, have to be resealed and the seals have to dry and then we would have to come another day to retest. So if you want to make an isolation room as airtight as possible to minimize the risk of infection, Ideally, you would have to think about air tightness from, from design stage because it is a lot easier to design and to build with air tightness in mind than to correct it afterwards. Um, we would have to pay attention and seal things like windows, viewing windows into the isolation rooms, um, electrical sockets, uh, water pipes, pendants, pipework, medical gases. And uh, when it comes to full ceilings, as you can see here, um, the, the air permeability levels will be determined by the envelope area, including the area above the false ceiling, unless the false ceiling is completely sealed. So what you see here in this picture is that we lifted some ceiling tiles uh, and we saw that the envelope above, above the, the ceiling, the false ceiling, needed to be resealed to achieve the necessary air tightness. Um, <clears throat> so the aim of BTS3 2018 is to calculate the air permeability of the room or rooms that constitute uh, an isolation suite, um, but also to calculate the flow rate through, through the room comp room's components, for example, doors, uh, grills that are on the doors, and, and other components during the, room, during the, the isolation room normal, uh, normal operation. Our recommendation is that the rooms achieve a level of air permeability of 2.5 cubic meters per hour per square meter at 50 pascals. Not that the rooms are going to work at 50 pascals, but this is how air permeability is normally expressed, a leakage at 50 pascals. 2.5 is, is not a random number. It, it is based on Bistria's experience with air tightness. As, um, as some of you may know, we have a, a very large air tightness department. Um, 
so we we agreed on 2.5 but in reality if you can get a smaller number uh, it would be it would be even better um, this number is is achievable uh, uh, for example in a mock-up environment at Pistria when we took care of uh, tennis from from the design uh, stage we achieve one cubic meter per hour per square meter and there are hospitals and there are other isolation rooms that can actually have this limit or lower. Um, if you think about if you think about what uh, one cubic meter per hour per square meter means, uh, it means if you if you have a, an isolation room that is working at ten pascals, basically it's equivalent at sixty liters a second of air that may be potentially contaminated because it's coming from an isolation room flowing into other areas of the hospital where staff may not be wearing PPE. <clears throat> so um, to put this in, in perspective, in this slide I wanted to show you some of the specifications of air permeability in, in other areas, in other fields. Um, but here in blue we have uh, our isolation rooms, so you can see is 2.5 cubic meters per hour per square meter at a, a pressure of 50 pascals. Um, and, and here is how much they would leak at other, at other pressures. So um, some other laboratories uh, that you can see here, for example, um, uh, an anthrax laboratory specification has actually has a really really tight specification it mustn't leak anything uh, up to 50 pascals for example and um, well here in yellow you can see um, some some supermarkets uh, and you can see that they are uh, less leaky than our isolation room but in in defense of uh, of an isolation room the area is smaller so a lower air tightness is more difficult to to achieve right to begin with testing the 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 ventilation system needs to be off but the dampers need to be open and what you need is uh, is a, a blower door and some tape to to seal the, the components and in in the standard you will see tables such as this one um, which uh, we lists some some components and it, it tells you where to put the fans, uh, the, the blower door fans, and uh, it lists other components and it tells you whether a door should be open, closed, taped, and taped for the following tests. And and the reason behind this um, is is not random. So the reason behind why we have to tape some doors at some points or why we have to tape the supply for this test but and tape it for the following tests is because we um, we do not want any room to help another room to achieve a better air tightness level. So what you see here for example is if we are testing the, the blue room here and we have another isolation room next door, the doors to this isolation room should be open because if we are pressurizing this room and we are, we are calculating the air permeability in this room, if this room is closed, this room can help, can, can achieve a better number than, than what its real air permeability is. And um, well, as, as an air tennis engineer, you also have to think of other, other principles. So for example, if, if we are pressurizing the, the blue room, uh, we need to get air from somewhere so that, for example, we do not negatively pressurize the corridor of uh, the corridor to all isolation rooms. We, we need to find a way to, to, to find the makeup air as well. Um, <clears throat> right, in, in this slide we see the relationship between the, the leakage and, and the, room, uh, the room pressurization, uh, which is which is uh, expressed by the following equation, Q equals C to times delta, delta P uh, to the power of N, where uh, Q is the, the leakage, which can be expressed in cubic meters per hour or liters per second. C is a constant and N is the exponent, which is normally 0.5 or 0.6. And del delta P is the pressure differential between the two sides, between the two sides of, of the fan. So what you, what you can see in this picture is actually we are testing an isolation room and we have a blower door 
uh, in in the isolation room, and we have we have sealed some components in in the lobby. We have sealed the pressure stabilizer, and we have sealed the supply. <clears throat> right. This is uh, just an example of how a curve like this uh, looks like. So on the on the x axis you would have the pressure differential, and on the y axis you have the cubic meters per hour. You have the leakage. So in an air tennis test, we can measure both, uh, both the pressure differential on both sides of the fan and, and the flow that goes through the fan and uh, to obtain curves such as this one. So the different air tightness points, once we interpolate them, that's what uh, give us the parameters that we saw in the previous equation. That's what give us the C constant and the N number, which in this case is 0.57. So in our methodology for testing, we recommend that you start by testing the overall envelope of, of the uh, isolation suite, which is marked in blue here. This, uh, this means that you would have to have uh, the end suite bathroom door open and uh, this door from the lobby into the isolation room open as well. This is not how normally the, the isolation, isolation room works, and we are aware of this. But um, the purpose of this is, is to, of this test is, is to save time. So if, if this test does not achieve 2.5 cubic meters per hour per square meter, then we would recommend stopping the testing and sealing, sealing the room, finding the gaps. Uh, we can we can carry out smoke tests to find where the gaps are um, because if the if the overall blue area that you see here does not achieve 2.5 cubic meters per hour per square meter, then the other tests are very likely to fail. So once we have achieved the overall uh, pressure in, in in the overall suite, we would we would. Uh, close the doors and we would do an air tennis test on, on the rest of the of the rooms. For example, uh, next would be the, the end suite, um, then the lobby, and then the, the patient's room. And for each of these tests, you have to move the blower door and you have to seal or unseal some, some components. And once we have finalized these tests, we can begin to test what the leakage in, in the room's, room, room's components uh, would be at the normal operating pressure. For example, we can see what the leakage through this door would be when, when, the, when the lobby is pressurized at 10 pascals. So if we wanted to, to test the leakage through this door, what we would do is we would put the blower door on this door here, where the mouse is, and we would do uh, we would test the air, the air permeability in the lobby with this door taped, and then we would repeat the test, but with this door untaped. So we would achieve two two um, tests like like this. This would be with the lobby door sealed, and this one up here would be with the lobby door unsealed. So obviously, if the door is unsealed, the room will leak more. And the leakage through the door at the operating pressure, so let, let's assume for, for an example purposes that the room is operating at 30 pascals. So the leakage would be actually this number, which is approximately 145 minus this number, which is approximately 55. So this would be the leakage through the door gaps at the lobby operating pressure. And then we can repeat this exercise to, to test the leak through other components, for example, the door grill in the end suite bathroom. So to sum up this presentation, we have seen how isolation rooms use pressure differentials and ventilation to contain airborne infection. We've seen how in the event of fan failure, walls protect against airborne infection. And we have seen how the integrity of the walls is fundamental for the rooms to work as, as they were designed. And um, we have gone through the methodology for testing air permeability in, in isolation rooms that PISRIA has developed. That is the end of the presentation. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate to ask me. I'll, I'll try and answer all your questions by email. Thank you very much for um, 
joining joining us today um, in this webinar.